Hello, and welcome to the Transforming Loneliness interview series. I'm Laura Parker, the creator and host of the series. Transforming Loneliness approaches loneliness with fresh and unexpected ways of seeing and responding that cultivate connection, belonging, and love. Today, I'm very happy to be with Tokopa Turner. Tokopa Turner is an award-winning Canadian author, dream worker, and international speaker. Blending the mystical tradition of Sufism in which she was raised with a Jungian approach to dream work, she founded the Dream School in 2001. Her best-selling and award-winning book, Belonging, Remembering Ourselves Home, explores the themes of exile and the search for belonging. Sometimes called a midwife of the psyche, Tokopa's work focuses on restoring the feminine, reconciling paradox, and facilitating sacred grief and ritual practice. I know Tokopa's work through reading her marvelous book. I love the sensitivity and depth and boldness of her writing, and it feels very necessary for our audience to receive her perspective on belonging. Tokopa, welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Laura. It is my pleasure to be here on this day to discuss this super important topic. I'm really glad that you're raising it. Thank you so much. So Tokopa, will you share with us how you think about what belonging is? Certainly. You know, I think most of us think of belonging as something that's outside of ourselves. And in fact, much of our lives goes towards the project of finding that place of belonging, that group of people that we belong to, that geography, that location, that partner. But what I started to realize when the question of where do I belong really began to confront me in my own life was that I started to understand through my own dreams, which seemed to be teaching me the more I focused on this question, that belonging isn't actually a place at all, but it's a set of skills or competencies that we in modern culture have lost or forgotten. So um, there are many different forms of belonging, like the ones that I mentioned. There are also some subtler forms of belonging, like the belonging we may or may not feel to our own bodies. The belonging that we may or may not feel to our gifts, to our abilities, to our authentic nature. There is also a greater form of belonging, which is, we might say, the belonging to God. The belonging to that something greater, that nebulous thing which feels out of our reach. And then, of course, there's the, the belonging to the earth itself, to nature, and belonging to the ecosystem of which we are a part. So as I started to explore the question of belonging, it just kept opening fathoms below fathoms to show me that there were actually many different forms of belonging and many different ways to make a courtship of those different forms of belonging. And that's how I ended up spending the next five years of my life devoted to exploring those questions and apprenticing myself really to this topic. Yeah, so thank you. I love the way that you first named that belonging, we tend to think that it's outside of ourselves. And that's so true in our culture. And then you also just set up this beautiful parallel between uh, belonging being not a place, but a set of skills. And that also you name all these multiple layers of the different kinds of belonging. And so you mentioned that this set of skills has been lost. Can you say more about how those skills have been lost? Absolutely. When we're talking about that kind of loss, 
I think we need to be having a conversation on three different levels because of course we have our personal stories and in our personal stories there are all kinds of ways in which we become disconnected from different parts of ourselves and that creates a feeling of unbelonging to our own selves. And, um, and then there is the level of culture because we are all embedded in a certain culture which aggrandizes and cherishes certain values and diminishes, devalues and dismisses or even outrightly ignores other values. And that creates a sense of unbelonging for all of those devalued parts. But then there is this third overarching piece, which is the ancestral piece. That of course we can't talk about belonging in the modern world without talking about where was the original place of exile? Where was the original lineage uh, broken? And so as you can imagine, it's a complex conversation, but I do like to start with the personal first because everyone can find that gateway into that original place where they felt perhaps in their family of origin or perhaps in their, um, the social culture when they were quite young, a sense of being an outsider. And um, as I was mentioning earlier, of course, this is mirrored at the level, level of culture as well, because culture aggrandizes and cherishes certain qualities and dismisses or rejects others. But this is usually mirrored at the level of family as well, because it doesn't differ from family to family that much because of this overarching culture. So often we um, may grow up in a family that really values intellectualism, but considers artfulness and an artistic or sensitive nature to be um, to be a, um, a hindrance to success in the world. And so it might be diminished or, or discredited or even criticized in us if we show those qualities. And so from family to family, we see a lot of um, similar kinds of exile at the individual level. And, um, and this is the result of a materialist culture which really values extroversion, strength, um, uh, individuality, and success. Moreover, those values we might associate with what some people call the feminine, what the Jungians call the feminine, which is an entire realm of qualities, not just pertaining to women, but to all of us, but which are associated with the feminine. So this is what we're talking about, the, um, the feeling life, the creativity, um, interconnectedness with one another, um, the, uh, the mystical arts, the instinctual or intuitive nature, and, um, and then li quite literally our relationship to nature itself. So it's a vast storehouse of qualities which our culture really doesn't value. And as a result, we become disconnected from those parts of ourselves. Those parts of ourselves become split off to the point where we ourselves become alienated from them. And it results in this feeling of loneliness, disconnection, numbness, and unbelonging, feeling like an outsider. Yes, I, it, just as you were talking and you were naming these qualities of feeling and creativity, intuition, instinctualness, uh, sensitivity, artistic nature, the intuition, that all of these, yes, they sound to me like qualities that are devalued in our culture and how, how very lonely it is to, for us humans to be disconnected from those qualities because as you said, they're a vast resource 
So we're basically cut off from this whole side of our nature that could be nourishing us, but it's because of our cultural and familial practices that then get translated into the personal, we're, um, we're cut off from that. Exactly. And then, and then the, the other piece, of course, is the one that you're talking about around loneliness. This way of being really fosters loneliness because it values um, the individual success versus our collective belonging and our collective value and our collective um, culture. And, uh, and so being such um, individualists, we forget that we have the ability to belong to each other. Yes, um, that's right. And so you're saying that as well, that these are, this is reinforced by the culture, that the culture values individualism. And then when we act accordingly, we're very isolated and we experience ourselves as separate. Um, so uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about the feminine? And you also mentioned in your book this quality that you call interbeing. I, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about both of those. And you've, you've mentioned the feminine, but is there anything else you'd like to add about that? Sure. Well, that, that word interbeing was coined by Thich Nhat Hanh, um, the Buddhist uh, scholar and spiritual teacher. And it's a beautiful wor word, interbeing, which quite literally means that we are, um, we are only in being because we are interconnected. And so as anyone who has studied nature can testify, all things depend on each other in order to exist. And this is a, um, an awareness that we have lost in isolation from each other. But any one thing that exists depends upon everything that surrounds it. So for instance, um, I could not exist without the air that I breathe, without um, the body which uh, um, keeps my heart beating without the light that um, that gives me energy, without the food that is grown from the earth, um, without the support system of technology, of my friends and family. And so I, I have this uh, image that I like to use, which is that of a reciprocal roof. Um, if you've ever seen one of these structures, they're so amazing. They are um, essentially um, just slats of wood that are um, leaning on each other from all sides, and it creates this incredibly stable roof. But if you pull out even one of those boards from that structure, then the whole thing collapses. And we are part of this larger ecosystem upon which we depend. It's only because of these many complex factors that we have come into existence. And so interbeing is um, a kind of uh, coming back into awareness uh, and reciprocity with that larger system all around us, which needs to be tended to as well in order to, um, to ensure the survival and thriving of all of us who live in its midst. Yes. And so it, it sounds like that you are you work with some some practices that might help us to uh, wake up our awareness of interbeing, and I'm just wondering if you might mention one that would help with that. Yes, well, you know, I've devoted my life to the practice of dream work, and um, so of what? What was that? Oh, dream work. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. So, um, so understanding the language of our dreams and then 
um, moving our lives in response to that which we receive through our dreams. And so um, I've really devoted my life to understanding the language of dreams. And uh, just to summarize the, my approach to this work, um, unlike a lot of Western approaches, Western psychological approaches to dreaming where we would analyze or interpret the dream as uh, emanating from the ego and from our thoughts. I believe that dreams are really nature, naturing through us. So in the same way that a um, tree bears fruit or a bush uh, makes flowers, that dreams are fruiting from us, that that comes from that same source, which we are connected to all things through. And so dreaming is a biological necessity and we cannot survive without it. Though many people don't remember their dreams or actively practice listening to their dreams, if deprived of dreaming, which takes place in uh, the deepest part of our sleep cycle, um, that we will actually go crazy. <laughs> so we need this. It's, it's a biological necessity. But um, there are some people who have devoted their lives to um, understanding this mother tongue. And this language is the language of symbols, of metaphor, of story, of myth, of archetypes. And so I believe that when we're paying attention to our dreams and we are making a kind of courtship to understand what they long for, what they are prompting us towards, that it is absolutely in service to not only our personal healing and wholeness or belonging, but to that larger belonging at, at the level of culture and at the level of ecosystem. So um, we have these amazing experiences when we come together in dreaming circles that we will begin to see certain symbols will come through many people in a dreaming circle at once. And we're amazed at the synchronicity of this. And as we begin to work with understanding the intelligence of these symbols, we begin to see that we are part of an ecosystem, not as a metaphor, quite literally an ecosystem, and that there is something that the circle itself is attempting to work out collectively. Mm -hmm. So dream work really requires us to come into that reciprocal roof-like structure in order to see what those pieces are. And then the real work is then how do we then respond to what we've received? How do we move our lives and respond? to the earth's dreaming yes and so I can hear in, in what you're describing that on a number of layers it really requires a change of identity like who we think we we are um, because when we're receiving a dream many of us might think oh I dreamed that but what you're saying is that actually we're receiving a communication that is um, from the I don't know if this is exactly how you would say it, but from, an, from our ecosystem. And then uh, in order to understand what it actually means, we need to be in a dream group. So there's a way that we also are collective in how do we understand the message we're receiving. And then the last piece that you said is how do we act on it? How do we bring it forth? And that of course requires just so much respect in order to take action based on the guidance we receive from dreams, we would have to believe that that, that guidance is, is worthwhile. And that, that rec that's pretty radical in our culture to have that stance. It, yes, so. absolutely, very beautifully put. And um, you know, when we look to indigenous cultures around the world, those that still have survived the monoculture spread, 
all of them historically have a dreaming practice at their center, that it is, um, it's the tribal inclination to listen to the dreaming because the dreaming will often tell you when it's time to migrate because the weather conditions are changing or what your particular um, role is in the tribe's necessity or what um, direction the tribe needs to move in order to intersect with the migration of um, you know the bison or whatever your hunted species are in symbiosis to to your well-being so so these are very um instinctual practices and it's really only in western culture that we have nothing like this and so the problem with that is over the course of many generations we have very few people who have um, devoted their lives to being an intermediary, to um, help providing that service in your community or in your family to, um, to help others understand what their dreams mean. Uh, but that being said, I should say, you know, I, I first started um, declaring that I was a dream worker out loud uh, almost 20 years ago. And at the time, whenever I would tell people that, I would get this blank stare, like, what even is that? And how weird are you? Like, you're obviously woo-woo, you know? Um, but now, I have to say, it's, it's getting more mainstream. In fact, we recently had a, a DreamWorks Summit, which had 30,000 people attending um, with some amazing speakers on it so if things are changing but to my feeling not quickly enough <laughs> yes and and I, I'm so thrilled to hear that you had 30,000 people attending the DreamWorks Summit because that does seem to speak to a movement towards honoring this indigenous way of receiving guidance and uh, that does seem like what our world needs. We need uh, to be returning. Although someone very wise said to me, it's not returning because returning is like saying that it's in the past and that indigenous ways of knowing actually are all about now, you know, that it's about in this moment. So then what I'm, what we're doing with the dreaming or with other practices that might return us to this indigenous way of knowing is trying to connect with that part of ourselves that is that is the feminine as you mentioned that is connected to the earth that is earth honoring and life honoring and that seems so necessary given what what's happening on our planet right now so let's see, uh, there's, I'm just going to return to my, well, the questions that I had written here. Um, let's see, well, you have described something in your book called false belonging. Can you describe a little bit about what that is? Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, the trap of false belonging is a phrase that was invented by the great Irish poet John O'Donoghue. And um, I believe it's in his book on Ankara, but it could be eternal echoes. I'll have to check my notes. But um, the trap of, uh, it is on Ankara, and the trap of false belonging um, he doesn't speak about it a great deal, but the words just really got my imagination flowing. And so the way that I understand false belonging is that if we, as we were speaking about earlier, if we are raised in a family which reflects the cultural values and um, uh, diminishes or devalues huge swaths of our wholeness of who we are meant to become, then in order to retain our place of belonging within that unit, you know, whether it's our families or whether it's a spiritual group or whether it's a friend circle or whether it's a workplace, in order to retain a sense of belonging in those places, we have to cut 
parts of ourselves off in order to be acceptable in those places. So this is what I call false belonging. It's a place where there is a hidden contract which requires us to remain silent or, um, or to behave in certain ways which are in denial of the fullness of our expression. And the, the, so, so just to sum up, we are much more susceptible to being attracted to places of false belonging when we ourselves have not made an encounter with the entirety of who we are. We become much more vulnerable to choosing and remaining in places of false belonging because we haven't understood that there is a difference between fitting in and belonging. Fitting in is like that, um, the image of, you know, the Grimm's fairy tale, the Cinderella fairy tale, where um, this is the very gruesome a version of the fairy tale where this people were actually cut women were cutting off their toes in order to fit into the tiny slipper and it's a gruesome image but it's it's it is exactly how the psyche perceives this kind of environment we have to cut off the bigness or make ourselves small or quiet or um pass in some way in our environment uh, in order to fit in there. Of course, this is something that people of color have to do every single day in order to pass in a, a predominantly white centered and um, white supremacist culture. So, um, so this is what we would call fitting in. Belonging is something entirely different. Belonging is creating or fostering a place where the entirety of who we are is allowed into our everyday experience and maybe not just allowed but venerated and celebrated yes and i can hear in what you're saying that it actually requires a lot of courage to practice belonging because we risk losing the belong the the false belonging and uh, some part of us believes that we need the false belonging in order to survive um, and that might have its roots in very early life where we actually do need our parents for our survival or, or some caregiver uh, and then that endures through the lifespan where we are in this kind of narrow belief that this this false belonging is is absolutely necessary for our very life and that perpetuates it but so i'm hearing how much courage it takes to actually pursue the kind of true belonging and and the difference between belonging and fitting in yes. like yeah i i think uh you pulled out a really important piece there which is that um, it's very often a life or death situation that creates the need for us to to cut those parts of ourselves off. Um, it often has to do with our very ability to survive. And so we're talking about something very deeply um, encultured for whatever reason. And, but there does come a point, though, in our lives where we will be either by our own accord or by the circumstances of our lives pushed out of false belonging. So maybe it looks like um, at a certain point um, we can no longer tolerate the lie that we're living or it might look like some kind of crisis on the outside where maybe we are suddenly exiled from or kicked out of, of previous false belonging. Or sometimes it actually looks like illness or demotion, you know, anything that pushes us out of that place of false belonging. And, um, and so sometimes we do this willingly, but most often we're not very willing and because it is such a matter of life and death and it is so scary. Um, and I call these initiations by exile. 
And the reason why I use that word initiation is because it is helpful to look at the pattern of nature operating in our own lives. And so if you've ever watched a, um, a flower recorded in its uh, blooming in time lapse, you'll see that it doesn't just bloom in one single uninterrupted motion. Actually, there are these subtle contractions before every large expansion. So it's really the way of nature to have these um, times, dynamic times in the process of belonging, where there are these periods of exile or aloneness. And this is, I think, where it really ties in with your focus, Laura, around loneliness, because um, being apart, being exiled, being an outsider is an absolutely essential and initiatory step towards coming into your true belonging. Yes, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, thing that you described with the flowers having these subtle contractions before the the big expansion and that sounds really right to me as you're describing it that that maybe uh, when you told that story I thought maybe there's a moment of fear or a moment of doubt that might make that contraction and then or maybe it's just a moment of gathering your resources in order to do the expansion. But whatever it is, that is such a beautiful uh, description. I love that metaphor. You know, I think of that um, beautiful poem by Hafiz, the great Sufi poet, who says, and maybe you've already mentioned this in, in some of your talks, but don't surrender your loneliness too quickly. It, um, it, it seasons you like so few human or even divine ingredients can. So I think the idea, the thing that Hafiz is talking about here is that, um, that it, he says, let it cut you more deep, actually, mm -hmm. because there is a presence in loneliness, which um, perhaps some people would call God, some people would call an encounter with source or spirit. Um, and the language that I like to use is nature, because there is this, there is this natural gathering that is possible in loneliness, where we come into contact with something so essential you know, like let's say we have been exiled from a previous false belonging. Well, in that loneliness, if we can surrender to it, if we can let it cut us, then we might have a chance of coming into true contact with the indigenous rhythms of our own that nature of who we really are you know in every heroic myth the hero or heroine of every story must endure a period of their own exile of their own loneliness where they leave the kingdom where they have to enter the dark thickets of the forest in order to be initiated into the medicine of their vocation it's in that loneliness that there's a chance that we can be initiated if we, if we keep entering into it, um, initiated into the who that we are becoming. And that we'll be less susceptible to false belonging on the other side. That there's something there, if we can withstand it, that will ferment and season us into becoming the hero or heroine of our own stories and in service to the world. 
Thank you so much for mentioning that part of it, the, the part of it that it's about, um, you know, the, the hero's or heroine's journey and that necessary uh, period of exile and how that serves to ripen us and to get us in touch with that, that gift that we're meant to bring to the world. Um, and this brings us to how do we uh, become more receptive or available to belonging? Uh, you use this beautiful phrase in your book called invitational presence, which I love. Um, I, I feel that your whole book is an invitational presence. Um, just even that phrase in itself, it, it invokes what it is talking about. And so um, can you say more about how we can be an invitational presence that is inviting belonging into our lives? Mm, thank you. Yes, no easy task. <laughs> well, uh, ultimately, if you believe that every dream that you receive is attempting to bring you into belonging, which is attempting to bring you into alignment with who you are, which is attempting to, which is a calling homeward. If you believe, and, I, and so I'm using the word dreams here because that is my particular spiritual focus, but we can expand the definition of dreaming here to, um, uh, to mean anything that um, arises through the emotions, anything that communicates to us through the body, and even the experiences of our lives. Mm -hmm. Rather than thinking of these things as random, considering that there is a, um, a greater something which is attempting through these mysterious means to restore us to a place of belonging. So if that is our foundational uh, understanding of being in the world, then, then it becomes easier to practice at being invitational. And so I love working with dreams to begin to practice this because there are so many dreams that we receive that, um, that are dark, and ugly and repulsive and terrifying. And our first instinct is to push them away as far as possible. We're certainly not going to write them down. We want to forget them as soon as we see them. But in my experience, those dreams are some of the most potent teachers for us. And if we can learn to, first of all, just be curious about them. And then somewhere down the line through our spiritual maturation, um, learn to become even uh, interested and hospitable towards those so-called dark figures. There is such a huge payoff because the energy that's contained within those clusters of so-called negative experiences or negative emotions or negative images can be freed up for reclamation, for integration. And um, to hold things at bay because they make us uncomfortable is to deprive ourselves of um, true belonging, really. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to bring in loneliness there because you mentioned this dark, ugly, repulsive figure that's in dreams. And I just couldn't help but think that many people feel that way about loneliness. Like when it arrives, they're like, ew, 
go away. I don't want to open the door to you. I just want to make you go away. And so you described how if we have that attitude, then we deprive ourselves of all that energy that is carried uh, by that visitor who is trying to invite us back into our wholeness by that by his or her arrival um, and and therefore we that's that's why we need the hospitable uh, practice of being inviting to these these figures and loneliness is just one of those but a very important one I I believe that um, loneliness is in, is an epidemic right now in the world uh, precisely because of the extent to which we have been divided from these parts of ourselves that you've been describing and so I I believe that loneliness is trying to invite us back into connection. Yes, I, I've actually um, devoted a chapter in my book, Belonging, to longing, the word longing. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's not a mistake that longing is in the heart of the word belonging, to be longing. Um, and I think longing and loneliness are almost synonymous because longing is really the, um, the ache for something that is missing from us. And, um, but, you know, in the beginning of the world, there was longing. Longing is the force that calls towards us that which is missing from our lives. Um, but there are some who say that longing is also the call, the calling to us homeward. So as Rumi says, that which you seek is seeking you, you know? So this longing is incredibly vital and it is really the cent one of the central practices of belonging is coming into conversation with that longing because it is that clarion call back towards that which is meaningful to us and uh, in relationship with each other as well. Beautiful. Thank you for naming that. I couldn't agree with you more. You said that longing is the ache for something that is missing. And I, it's, it's beautiful what you've said there. Thank you. You're welcome. It's like we have to begin with that absence, you know, and um, and allow that absence to enlarge our lives. And, and what I mean by that is instead of trying to push it away or assuage it, to actually um, let it enlarge us because that which we long for is powerful and it has so much um uh, magnetism in it in the sense that uh, it, it's a kind of gravity when we long for something there's something big trying to reach us as well it's so beautiful and honoring the the way you say that that you you and I even hear a kind of a power in your voice as you're saying it uh, the words power magnetism and gravity uh, that are in our longing. And so I just want to leave that as a place where we will come to an end here, uh, even though there's so much more we could say. Uh, and so thank you really deeply from, from the bottom of my heart for everything you've shared with us today. It's, it's incredibly rich, and I'm so glad that uh, our listeners will have the chance to you know, listen again, I'm sure I will, you know, that, that it's, it's recorded here for us. So lastly, is there anything you'd like to just let our listeners know about upcoming ways to work with you? Like, what are you up to and how can they engage with your work? Oh, thank you for that invitation. Well, it's been a wonderful conversation and I uh, appreciate the spaciousness you created for this magic to your eyes. <laughs> Surely out of your own longing it came. And so uh, to answer your other question, um, I am uh, just about to release a course with the dream work, uh, sorry, with the shift network. It's called 
recording the dream. And uh, this is a seven week course, which is all about learning how to approach our dreams, learning how to be in respectful courtship of them and how to uh, use ritual to move um, move our lives in the direction of the longing that is um, encountered in our dreams. So that is a very exciting new project that I'm about to put into the world. And um, I'm also going to be doing a, um, a live stream talk on the subject of belonging as a skill. So that will be coming up in February. And um, so people could just visit my website, which is tokopa.com, T-O-K-O-P-A.com. And I will always list current events there. So if you want to get in touch, that's the best way to find me. All right. Well, that's wonderful. And thank you so much, Tokopa.